it's time for a warm camp up welcome for our second speakers. Now, let's let's keep the welcome going because there's a few speakers here and I'm going to introduce them. Uh, so first off, we have Max Vlichko. Hi, Max, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Max. I'm from Microsoft Defender ATP, Microsoft Antivirus Solution. Uh, next, we have Jeffrey Calvis. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff, uh, PM on the Outlook team. Hang out on Outlook and Office Slack channels. Excellent. Eric Schwieber is our third presenter today. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric Schwieber. I'm a principal engineer on Office for uh, Apple platforms. Mac, iPhone, iPad, uh, the whole gamut. Excellent. Next, we have Jonathan Leung. Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Leung. Uh, you may know me from the OneDrive channel, and I'm a PM on the Sync client. Next up, we have Gita Lakshmana. Hello, everyone. My name is Gita Lakshmana. I am one of the engineers working at Remote Desktop for Mac and a little bit of iOS uh, remote desktop for iOS as well. Fantastic. Let's see, we have, uh, next we have Harry Krishna. Is it Juturu? Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey everyone. I'm Harry Krishna. I own the Teams Mac app. Uh, I'm an engineering manager for it. Fantastic. Finally, we have Paul Bowden. Hey everyone, um, Paul Bowden. I uh, own deployment uh, updates and management on the uh, Office of Mac Suite. All right, thank you everyone for introducing yourself. Um, I, we have a few questions to start off, um, and I just want to announce before we get going, uh, please do enter your Q&A throughout this session. Uh, do not wait till the end. We'll, we'll try and take your questions as we go through, but we do have a couple to start with. Um, so we have uh, Eric first here, um, and I'm going to read off the question for you, Eric, if that's all right. All right. So as a community, especially on the Mac and Min Slack, how can we best help you all at Microsoft with building, deploying, and supporting the Microsoft Mac and iOS apps? All right, that's a lot there. Um, I, I think, uh, well, certainly one of the biggest things is talk to us. Tell us where we screw up because we're going to screw up. Uh, tell us where we got it right. Um, and then use the tools. Uh, use uh, Office uh, Microsoft Auto Update uh, as much as you can to deploy. Um, don't repackage the apps uh, because we've tried to get it all uh, right for you. Um, but I think really a lot of it comes down to uh, open lines of communication. Uh, we love hearing from you. We love uh, knowing the problems that you're facing um, so that we can solve them and, and do the right thing. Anybody else have a comment? Yeah, I'd like to add to what uh, Eric has mentioned. So, uh, so actually so far uh, for specifically for remote desktop for Mac, uh, the community has been really helpful and responsive with us. Uh, everyone have reached out, reached out to us when there's an issue or when there was uh, features that you guys like to see. Um, so a couple of the notable features in remote desktop for Mac, like the scripting support for managing desktops and workspaces and Unicode characters keyboard support was actually born out of uh, uh, constant communication with the uh, 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 with the community on the uh, uh, Microsoft RDC channel. So that was uh, really uh, I was re I'm, re I'm really appreciative of what you guys are um, doing over there. Um, but on top of that, you could, uh, as, as what Eric said, um, just keep an open line of communication with us, try, use, the, uh, use the apps, and um, we have some beta uh, apps as well. So it uh, would be really good to, for you guys to try out and uh, give us feedback along the way. Um, and you can always reach, us, uh, reach out to us on the, uh, uh, on the Mac Admins channel. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I'll comment? jump in next. Um, basically wanted just to, to build off of the fact that the feedback is great um, even when we're not actively uh, in a specific channel you know we're monitoring um, the communication the collaboration has been great uh, we do want to hear yet you know the pain points right uh, for admins but also for your end users um, all of that has really helped um, in terms of the features we work on the order and priority uh, but also just yeah admin capabilities 
I think on Outlook, uh, we've come a long way with uh, providing uh, better admin access, new pref keys to help deploy uh, and to manage. And um, one other thing for Outlook specifically, uh, you may already be aware, we've been working on a new app, uh, you know, moving away from EWS and REST sync, uh, new search, um, and you know, basically a whole new app. So the, the feedback on from Insider Fast from uh, admins has been great. And uh, one thing we're working on is to uh, provide a new pref key to enable that new Outlook switch, uh, even if you're not an Insider Fast. So a little mini announcement, uh, we'll have more information in Mac admins, but uh, wanna you know, work with admins to, to get feedback on Outlook specifically. So keep it up. Next question. Fantastic. Let's see. Okay. Um, so we've got another question uh, for Harry. Uh, actually, could you give us a timeline on native Mac OS notifications for Teams for Mac? Yeah, uh, I think uh, that native Mac notifications is one of the you know most requested feature. Uh, We've been working on it. Uh, we have uh, internal builds. Uh, it will be similar to what Windows is, uh, where you have an option to select the custom notifications or native notifications, uh, which is which is already released for Windows. So that that's out now. We're going to do uh, it for uh, Mac right now, uh, and it's an internal uh, builds. Uh, we targeted to go out this year. I don't have an exact timeline. Uh, the team is working hard on it to get to get it out as soon as. Uh, possible and as quickly as possible, uh, but uh, we'll definitely have some announcements going out uh, pretty soon. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Jonathan, uh, here's another question for you. Lots of companies are looking to OneDrive as a future backup solution. Is it fair to expect an improvement in OneDrive for Mac in the sense of more capabilities and a full backup feature? <laughs> Uh, so let me rephrase the question. When is Mac KFM coming? Uh, so this is a question we kind of get on a on a weekly basis in the Mac uh, Slack channel. Uh, sorry, the OneDrive Slack channel. Um, so I have nothing new to announce uh, to anybody out there, uh, but this is evidently a highly requested feature, and it'd be a very odd thing for us to not take a deep, long, hard look at doing uh, in the future. Uh, something we're looking into, but uh, I have nothing new to share currently. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, Max. I have a question for you. Um, when will Defender add an endpoint security support to prevent known threats at process level, preventing execution, as well as build on the use of the built-in Gatekeeper, XProtect, and MRT tools? Uh, parentheses visibility logging, especially. Uh, there are two questions in a single question, so let me answer them one by one. Uh, first of all, the first part, uh, it's not clear what, uh, what functionality is expected, but I'll assume it's about fileless attacks and uh, it's uh, on our plate. Uh, we plan to implement it later, but no uh, commitment date so far. Uh, for the second, uh, actually, we didn't uh, get much uh, uh, request for this, and we are uh, we base our uh, work on uh, customer feedback. So, uh, if uh, if it's about integration between uh, Defender and uh, uh, macOS uh, security features. The, and you have something on your mind, please leave uh, your feedback. Uh, we uh, you can do it in uh, Microsoft Defender itself. It help me. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Paul, I have a, a quite a large question for you here, so forgive me. Uh, can we get all the Microsoft apps using the same sign on and username technology that the core apps use? Uh, for example, on a brand new computer, my users open Outlook. It pre-populates their username, activates a license, set up Outlook for them. I launch Teams and I get to type in the username and have to tell it to access my organization access cert. Uh, OneDrive, I can launch and get it to type in my username and password and I have to go through several steps. Edge, 
I would like to have to do again, but it seems like I had to tell it my identity as well. So I think by default, it should use the SSO creds and then new identities can prompt for info since they obviously are going to be different. Yeah, so this is a great question. It's a long question, um, but it's one that comes up uh, a lot and, uh, and and for several years. So so the, the current state of play is, as uh, anybody who's used the kind of the, the, the core office apps, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and OneNote knows, um, we've uh, we've always had this kind of credential sharing via the keychain uh, for those apps. So you activate one of those apps, and then the other four apps become automatically activated and and, and signed in. And and we've kind of been in that state for, for the last several years. But of course, the number of apps um, that we've developed um, has has grown rapidly. Um, but the kind of the technology has you know previously always used their own kind of like storage mechanism for um, for the OAuth tokens. There's uh, some really exciting work um, that has been taking place. Uh, in fact, uh, my, my hat's off to, to Jonathan and the OneDrive team because they've been really kind of blazing the trail here. And uh, if, if you set up uh, uh, OneDrive in the last probably two to three weeks, you'll have noticed that if you've already uh, signed in with any of the other Office apps, then when you go to launch OneDrive for the first time, you uh, you, you don't have to type your password again. Um, you can enter just, you can either enter the uh, a different username or the same username as, as what you, you currently have, um, but uh, OneDrive will then instantiate um, a, a kind of a new token type in the keychain, which we call OneAuth. And one off is this new uh, stack that we're all migrating to for uh, for keychain sharing. And uh, in fact, uh, Edge has previously migrated uh, has migrated to that as well. So if you uh, if you run up Edge on your machine, it'll ask you to sign in and. Again, it won't prompt you for a password. It'll just consume that kind of one auth credential. And uh, then over the, the coming months, um, we'll have other teams coming online, um, including the Teams team and uh, and also uh, Intune Company Portal as well. And we'll, we'll finally be able to get to this like Nirvana scenario where I just have to enter my username and password once and then all of my other Microsoft apps um, just uh, consume those uh, same creds and same tokens. So uh, really exciting stuff that's going on here. Awesome, sounds great. Congratulations again to uh, Jonathan. That was, sounds like some great work. Um, okay, so the next question I think uh, for Harry, uh, for Harry, sorry. What do you see are the pros and cons of building the Teams ecosystem on a cross-platform foundation like Electron? At the macro level, even outside of Microsoft, is the future? Is this the future of apps? From an admin perspective, we get consistent features uh, across desktop platforms. Um, but the iOS app feels like a better Apple platform app, uh, but is obviously limited in technology. Yeah, I, uh, I think the, the when we take, took the bet on Electron like three years ago, uh, uh, with with moving to web apps and. Uh, Leveraging the web technologies for uh, for all calling scenarios, and you know the functionalities, richness we are getting, uh, and we, the 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 pace we can deliver features or functionality to our uh, end users across Mac, Linux, Windows, all all three platforms, and even web browsers, right? Like uh, even uh, different other endpoints which Teams is going after, um, like the 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 beauty of uh, Electron or any other web application. Uh, is your cross-platform ability and going out uh, to all the customers at kind of like the similar time frame. Like um, at the macro level as well, I think that's that's the biggest advantage we have seen. Um, uh, the con, I, I think, uh, is I, 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 I don't have any, uh, you know, hey, are, what are the things which we are missing by doing this cross-platform electron kind of an application? Uh, most of the native functionalities we can definitely integrate like the native notifications or OS integrations to dark mode or any other things. Uh, we can definitely you know, leverage those APIs. Uh, Electron as a framework, Node as a framework is providing us the extensibility model to integrate into this different uh, 
thing, different sorts of different sorts of uh, OS abilities. Uh, again, with Electron and uh, with web applications, there is definitely you know heightened uh, uh, memory pressure, CPU consumption. I know that's this uh, that's that's a concern. We we know we are we are working against. That's the tide we are kind of you know uh, trying to. Uh, work against and you know see how we can reduce our uh, our memory footprint and on the CPU and CPU hit uh, the Teams app is gonna or any Electron app is giving onto the under the machines right like be it on Windows be it on Mac be it on Linux uh, it's the same story but uh, again different hardware different GPU drivers come into play different uh, you know features we are adding on top of Teams also have a lot of uh, uh, lot of implications like you know seven by seven video streaming ba custom backgrounds uh, which we are all using right now which is uh, also increasing the load on the cpu and gpu so we're kind of working through that so that's the con on uh, which we are kind of like working uh, actively on um uh i I hope I answered answered that but uh, anyone uh, would like to add to it on the web application please do uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so, so I've been a, a native app developer for uh, going back to college, mumble mumble years ago. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think even as as the questioner commented, you know, there there are certainly pros and cons to both approaches. Um, the the electron or a web app approach, I think, gives you rapid prototyping, rapid uh, development, rapid deployment across multiple architectures, multiple platforms, which is great for getting a first product out, for getting the initial scenario, for, for trying something new. It's wonderful for that. Uh, and as people have noticed, it misses some of the perhaps richer environment that's that's available on this native platform or that native platform. And so uh, I, I think there are ways that you could say you could start with Electron and then add more native features on top or as you transition, as you as you establish a user base and, and, and functionality. Um, even Office, which is 99.8% native app, uh, is using some uh, React uh, frameworks for, for some smaller controls where we want to tweak UI designs, play with some stuff, um, explore the edges of what we can do from a design perspective, from a feature perspective. And so you end up, um, it's a trade-off. There are pros and cons, but sometimes you can, you can leverage, you can leverage the pros while you work on something else to balance out those cons with, with, uh, maybe a electron to native transition or a native app that you didn't want to quickly prototype something that works everywhere to see what gets better flavor. So there are different ways to play it off, um, and I don't think either is right or wrong. I think it's it's um, a measure of balance. You know, 20 years ago when I started working in Office 20 plus, there was no web app, and so you had to write everything separately four times, um, or actually, as Microsoft tried to do with Word six, you know, write everything once targeting Windows, and and it was abysmal. Um, so times change and it's very interesting to see how how we get to put all this stuff together that's one of the reasons i love working in this industry yeah uh just want to add on eric's thing the the web technologies have are evolving with uh, with chrome and with edge betting on chrome i think there's the web technologies the apis on the web api stack are getting more and more richer native experiences that's also helping helping apps like based on Electron or any other web app developers, you know, to go closer to a native thing. Uh, like be it like how we're doing multi-window right now, you know, you wouldn't have, we wouldn't, we didn't thought like, you know, being an Electron app, how do we do multi-window with like, you know, have the same constraint, like give the same richer native experience kind of thing. So I, I think there's definitely, as Eric mentioned, there's, there's an evolution which is happening and we are on the way which we are trying to, you know, ride that. Okay. And uh, one thought to add as well, that I think, uh, you know, I definitely agree with Harry and Shreve in terms of there's kind of no right or wrong answer. I think one thing that, that is really important is the mindset that you have going in um, and being respectful for to, to every platform that you run on. I think, um, 
you know, especially when you when you can see how a web app can you can get up and running on multiple platforms very quickly, you know, there's a danger you could end up with this kind of very generic app that is, you know, kind of distilled and works OK across all platforms. Um, but doesn't have that kind of like that 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 deep integration or that that kind of real thoughtfulness um, about you know how do you take real advantage of every platform's features. So so I think I think kind of the the, the development mindset is really important as well. You've got to got to make sure that you know, if you go down a web app route that you know that that app looks and feels so comfortable on each of the platforms that you support. OK, great, great, great point. Thank you. Um, I have a, a OneDrive question for Jonathan, actually. Uh, so I can see my files in OneDrive for Mac, but I can't see files that are shared with me, uh, similar to um, the iPhone shared tab device. Is there a, a feature that we could be added to or a plan to add access to shared OneDrive locations from within the Mac's Finder? Uh, I don't think we have any concrete plans to build that out as of yet. Uh, this is something we hear from time to time from different enterprises uh, in terms of, yep, I, I'd love to be able to see uh, things that have been shared with me on the Mac. Uh, and just to kind of give a little bit of color and detail here, um, it is a bit of a challenge for us to go and create that and sync that down on a local machine. Um, just because this content set isn't actually a, a real folder. There is no folder on the service that actually has all this different content uh, in it. So it's a virtual view of that. And what we kind of run into uh, when, you know, just on, on a high level is you're going to get into a lot of complex nesting scenarios and duplication of content. Uh, because when we do sync it down into onto the local Mac, uh, I mean, it's just on the file system uh, and you have complete access of that. Whereas on iOS and web, uh, they're allowed to kind of limit that view so you only see a virtual view and have that proper linking in the background. Uh, now with Mac OS 11, they do have some new capabilities for us to kind of uh, rein in a little bit of control in terms of what you see in the file system. Uh, so that's something we're going to be looking into, but uh, no concrete plans right now to uh, develop that. OK, great, thank you. Um, so Max, uh, I have a Defender question. Uh, when will Defender mirror the Office approach of providing insider and slow track release notes? I feel your pain. Yes, we know about this uh, problem, and uh, yes, I am. I would like to add it as much as possible. So the reason here is that we are an agile team, and releases are short, and yes, sometimes we don't have enough time for insider builds. OK, fair enough, great. Um, Jeffrey, uh, uh, will the new Outlook be able to do junk man mail management similar to how it exists on Windows? Yeah, uh, good question. So uh, the two areas that you know we're providing in uh, Outlook as a client uh, right now, we have mark as junk, which is essentially you know a move command for the message to go into the junk folder. And one thing we're adding that is in kind of the legacy Outlook app that's not yet in. Uh, the new Outlook is block sender, right? So that's also a, a mark is junk command, but then it's uh, syncing that list, you know, the sender to a synced list of blocked senders. And a longstanding, you know, limitation of EWS and our legacy app was you couldn't, you know, view or change the list of blocked senders in the app itself. Uh, we would, you know, say use the web app. And so that's something that is coming, we'll be able to do. Um, I think, you know, when I look at junk mail management, like the actual, you know, heuristics of what's determined as junk and not, uh, I think the general consensus is we're trying to move that to the service level. Um, you know, the, the service in aggregate is trying to decide what's junk, uh, you know, at a, at a larger level. And so I don't think, you know, the more client side approach of keeping a list of these of what I think is junk for you know, maybe one or more accounts in Outlook is something uh, we're not planning to add. Um, really what we're relying on is good junk mail management uh, by the account type, right? Whether it's your work account or a third party consumer account. And so that's what um, you know, 
that's what the plan is for now. And I think getting the synced, blocked, and safe sender list will be a good step. We'll want to get feedback on that, um, and then we'll go from there. Okay, fantastic. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to bug you again. I got another Outlook question. Can you? Com oh, I'm, I'm sorry, not Outlook. Uh, OneDrive question. Can you comment on when we'll see an official known folder move for Mac OS? And can you also explain what known folder move is? Sure. Um, uh, known folder move is the idea that you can move uh, some of the more important or common workplace uh, folders uh, into OneDrive so that any content you add in there uh, gets autom automatically backed up uh, by the service. Uh, so we have this feature on Windows today where uh, you can move your documents, pictures, and desktop folders into OneDrive automatically. Uh, so that you know all that contents backed up. Uh, I cannot comment on when it will be coming or if it will be coming on the Mac uh, as per the first question of the day for me today. Uh, but again, uh, something we are definitely taking a look at. Uh, it is very highly uh, requested. All right, great. Um, Harry, we've had a, well, someone has had some complaints from users about slow performance and battery life with Office, especially with Teams during video calls. Uh, what kinds of performance optimizations are in the pipeline for the Office apps and for Teams especially, despite being an Electron app? And a follow-up, how does this picture change with the transition to ARM, which I'm sure you know a lot, you're very prepared to talk about. I, I can take the, the Teams one, the video call one, uh, and uh, maybe someone else can take the Office one. Uh, for the Teams part, uh, Definitely, as I said, uh, there are so many new features we are we are we are releasing for video calls with seven by seven and custom backgrounds, uh, multi-window uh, scenarios. Uh, there is definitely uh, uh, issues which we are uh, actively working on and trying to optimize CPU and GPU load, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's definitely top of mind for all of us in Teams. And, and the team is already working on 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 these uh, metrics to you know get better and uh, make make that issue not be a problem uh, as we add new features as we uh, as we roll out new uh, new features which um, which require CPU or GPU load uh, is uh, is optimized like like any other native app and it's not uh, uh, harming the system which uh, which users are using. Um, so that's on uh, the team's video call, uh, you know, battery or slower performance issues. Anyone wants to add on the office side? I, yeah. I can take the arm and, and office performance uh, question. Um, so the first thing I would say is that if you have known performance uh, issues, um, let us know. You know, send us send us an email uh, or ping us on the Slack channel. Uh, we'd be happy to engage uh, and probably ask you for some um, uh, technical information to collect for us to help us diagnose issues. Um, but as far as what are we doing going forward and what does ARM do, we we actually have uh, some folks working on some uh, built-in profiling tools uh, that would actually ship as part of the, the app so that. Um, we can uh, ask you to collect profile data and, and, and it will show us um, not uh, basically what is the app doing when you're trying to run through your scenario and then we can look at the traces that we get back that are you know vetted with your permission um, and see you know, where are the hot spots in the code where are we spending an inordinate amount of time uh, what's going on um, and we are constantly working to improve that sort of thing um, you know the apps if you're not doing anything should be taking you know less than the percent if not close to zero percent of your cpu time so if you ever see a case where you're not touching the keyboard you're not typing anything and word is taking you know one two three five ten percent of your cpu let us know because it shouldn't be doing that and we definitely want to fix that so what does arm transition mean um first of all uh, we've only uh, officially known about this for a, a week so uh, we can, it's new for most of the folks on this team i actually spent uh, the last three months under nda uh, working on bringing office up on the arm apps if you saw that 30 second demo in the wwc keynote uh, for apple that was real code that really was office running on those arm cpus um, but it's new and so we don't have a lot of specific um knowledge or information you know we haven't seen actual max from apple uh, running arms cpus so that we can do performance analysis on them um, 
the information that I saw coming out of WWC is that the architecture is wildly different from Intel. Uh, instead of uh, all cores being exactly the same, there are, there are high performance and low performance efficiency cores. And so there'll be some tuning we have to do on the apps. Um, you know, it's, it's always historically been that just kick a task off to a thread, run it in the background, it doesn't matter, it'll get done at some point. And now there's going to be the notion of, well, should that run in a high prior, high performance or a low performance queue? Uh, if it's work that has to be done at some point and it doesn't really matter when it gets done, that can be a low performance, low, uh, you know, uh, low bandwidth task. Uh, just run it at some point system and get back just when you're done. Uh, but if it's Excel recalc where you you want your financial data now, 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 that should be a, a high performance core task. Um, so I guess the short answer is we don't know, but it's a really interesting new world and we are eager to dive into it and figure it out. And Office will be native on those apps as soon as we can get it shipping and uh, on those Macs as soon as we can get it shipping uh, because we want our customers to have a real native experience. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I have another four part question here that I'm going to try and break down. Um, Hi, A team. When will there be a Microsoft rep in the Microsoft Teams Mac admin Slack channel? Um, and when will there be correct version numbers for Teams? When will Teams be a real Mac OS app? I think we kind of talked about that. And when will Teams be integrated in Microsoft Auto Updater? Uh, I can take that, uh, Myers. Um, the so uh, for the MS rep for uh, Microsoft Teams, I think Bill and uh, Marion, uh, my counterpart uh, from Prague, they are they are unable to join this meeting, but they are already on the Mac admin Slack channel. Uh, if not, I'll make sure uh, I'll take that as an action item uh, to go and uh, you know figure that part out. Uh, but they should be already on it. Um, on, the, on the version number, I think uh, that that's that's an open item which. Uh, which was not yet completed. I'll definitely uh, make sure that's uh, that's tracked out uh, properly. Uh, and Teams integration into Marv, uh, this is being worked right now, and uh, I think it's in the backlog. Uh, we are working with Paul's team, Paul Bowden's team, on uh, uh, on how to integrate into uh, the the Microsoft Auto Updater, and you know, uh, along with Teams Auto Updater, how do how do we integrate into Microsoft Auto Updater uh, for Macs? OK, great. Um, general question for the group, will boot camp come to back on ARM? Uh, I'll grab that one as well. Uh, so that's really a question, I think, for Apple, uh, because Apple is the, the company that, that wrote boot camp and made it work on, on the Macs uh, to then run Windows. Um, however, I think I can answer it in that I believe um, Craig Figueroa said that there would not in I think it was the talk show some some I saw some video somewhere uh, where he said that there would not be direct boot uh, that their vision for the ARM based Max was that it would be done, done through virtualization, uh, which I think means that no, there's no boot camp, no, there's no running of of x86 Windows on these that it would have to be uh, some sort of virtualization uh, system and maybe ARM-based Windows at some point. I don't know. I work on Office, not Windows, but I think the short answer is no bootcamp. Okay. But that's Apple. That's Apple, fair, fair enough. Um, not a question, but a comment. These guys are an invaluable resource on Slack and their participation is very much appreciated. So, well done, everyone. Let's see. The next question I have is kind of an e in the deep weeds question. But can someone explain how a drag and drop in a Word document with track changes turned on is sometimes flagged as a moved insertion versus an insertion? So that's a fun question. I have no idea. I think that's that's going to be a question we'd have to take back to the Word team. Uh, if well, if file whoever asked the question wants to ping us directly uh, with some steps to actually make it show up, we'll happily take that back to the Word team and ask them. All right, fantastic. Um, let's see, our users hate change. Hmm, it's the first time I've heard that. While I am excited for new Outlook experiences, I know they will not be. Is there a plan for supporting, on supporting both interfaces for a period of time similar to the toggle switch on the Insider builds? 
Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, short answer is yes. You know, this toggle switch that's in Insider Fast, you know, will bring that eventually to slow and then eventually to production. Um, the plan is to have overlap. It's going to be for some time, I'll say, um, partially because we're adding features. So I know a lot of the Q&A, uh, the questions posted here are about, you know, this feature, that feature, parity, which I'll kind of maybe we'll save for another answer, but uh, we'll continue to add features. Also the account types, right? And so this is something we know we have support for Exchange Online, which are Office 365 accounts, Outlook.com and Google accounts, but not on-prem yet, not generic IMAP or POP, uh, things like iCloud. You know, we're eventually going to get full iCloud sync, mail, calendar, and contacts. And so the toggle kind of helps us in the fact that you could still have those old accounts on the old stack syncing when you're in that experience. And then when you go into new Outlook, uh, you can have your accounts on the new stack. Um, and so then, the, you know, another side effect is, yes, if you're trying to get used to an experience or used to uh, learning it, um, you can have that toggle on and off. Um, I also mentioned earlier about providing admin capability to control that experience, right? Um, you know, if, if uh, you want to deploy the switch in a certain position by default, you can. That's something we want to, um, you know, promote and have admins use. So, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to you know, a, a, a period of time where we have both going, we're going to be obviously adding more features in the new outlook uh, and new capabilities. And one other thing I'll mention is you'll notice there's a switch, or there's a dialogue on the switch. When you turn off the new outlook, you know, we say, why are you leaving? And we look at every piece of feedback. It's a lot. And so some of the feedback has been like, this is confusing, but really it's mostly been features like, this looks great. It's syncing fast. Search finally works. Um, and the feedback really has been about, I need this feature in the old outlook like rules. And so rules is something we're working on right now. And once rules is there, I'll be back, you know? And so uh, we want to capture why users are leaving, toggling. And if we do learn that, yeah, you know, it's, they don't like change and I just can't get used to it. That's something we want to uh, work on and maybe tweak the experience to help improve that. So good question. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so the next question is, are, are there any plans to bring Visio to the Mac? And I'd just like to add on top of that. How about um, any plans to bring the, um, oh crap, I remember, I forget the name of it now, the Access. Are <laughs> thinking, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a whole bundle of questions, questions or, or apps that come up here. There's uh, Visio, there's Access, there's Publisher, um, and I'm probably forgetting a, a couple as well. So, so the strategy on uh, for, for those apps um, that have been around on the on the Win32 platform for for many years is that uh, we'll be bringing them to Mac via the kind of web interface. Um, so you won't see them come along as native Mac apps, um, but uh, the, the, those teams are working to enhance both kind of the, the read and write fidelity of uh, editing things like Visio diagrams via you know a web browser. So so that's the strategy there. We do have um, the uh, the viewer uh, as a, a native app on iOS for for Visio. Um, but but web web is the way forward for those. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, there's a couple questions here that I want to try and combine on the Mac App Store and deploying the Office uh, Suite through the Mac App Store. Um, will it, will it be possible to 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 allow users to deploy the app uh, the Office Suite through their App Store, but then license it with a volume license in another way? And additionally, is there any way to prevent those updates from occurring uh, that may break a plugin that's required for those tools um, from the App Store. Sure, it's kind of a, yeah. A oh. oh, you're muted, there you go. Yeah, here we go. So yeah, loaded question. Uh, let me give you some kind of simple answers. So we have uh, no plans right now to bring um, volume licensing support to the Mac App Store apps. They were designed for Office 365 subscription. Um, so the, there is no kind of change there that, that we're looking at. Um, 
in terms of um, deployment with Mac App Store apps, there's uh, there's 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 an ongoing conversation um, with Apple about uh, VPP deployment of um, of Office and the Mac App Store. Um, a number of customers are, are either getting uh, uh, error 72 timeouts when attempting to uh, deploy the Mac App Store apps or they're finding that the App Store apps actually don't update when they expect. And so there's some some ongoing kind of issues there that uh, that we're all tracking. Um, if you're using the App Store with a, a, a user account, meaning like a, an App Store account that, that you own, then uh, a lot of those issues kind of don't exist. It's, it's really kind of tied to VPP and the way that architecture works. Um, in, in terms of deferring updates uh, from the App Store, there's uh, the, the kind of the the switches that you have at the OS level for things like you know a 90 day deferral. Those things that those switches really only apply to the OS itself and first party apps like Safari. They don't apply to other apps coming down through the App Store. So um, if you're going for a Mac App Store deployment, then then you really you know you, you should be signing up for getting the updates, you know, within a few days of us releasing them to the App Store. You know, th that's really the, the, the primary design there. Um, I guess there was a, you know, interesting question about, you know, WebEx plugins here and uh, I'm with Outlook and uh, I'm going to switch that over to Jeffrey because because uh, he's the expert there. Yeah, so um, yeah, with respect to uh, plugins and plugins breaking. This is something you know we've been dealing with for quite some time uh, with Outlook for Mac. You know, whenever there's an OS update or ever we're making changes, like moving to a new sync stack, like we're doing right now, uh, plugins are breaking. And so, really, we've been working on a path to move uh, toward using add-ins, the Office 365 add-ins, um, the top you know meeting provider add-ins like WebEx and Zoom and BlueJeans, um, having those um, you know, available and have, having good functionality that they actually work in Outlook um, is something we're trying to move towards so that we can move away from those plugins that are breaking. And you know, when we look at the health of our app, you know, whenever we have a, an update, um, you know, say we just released the June production update, we'll see these spike and crashes and then we'll find that they're all from coming from Zoom or something like that. And so month over month, our biggest you know crashers and your end users are saying Outlook's awful, like it crashes all the time. And it's oh, it's the Zoom plugin, right? And so we're we're on a path to move away from those. Um, and and part of that is making sure that the add-in is working and doing what you know you would expect out of the plugin. Uh, so I think that's that's. Uh, part of the answer there, and you know, I think um, Faisal, who is my peer colleague on the Outlook team in Mac Admins, has been working on some uh, articles to explain the path to moving out away from those plugins. And um, and so I think if you have questions more on plugins and add-ins, please post them in uh, Slack, and we'll get to them. Okay, great. Um, will the OneDrive for Mac ever get the ability to sync other local Mac directories, specific, specifically desktop and documents? Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of known folder move questions. Uh, so again, same as before. Uh, I will comment here about other local Mac directories. Uh, we currently have no plans to support additional uh, other folders outside of the main three uh, in general for known folder move. Uh, just because um, we don't want to get into a territory where uh, we're ingesting, you know, everything on the, the computer uh, uh, on behalf of the admin. Uh, so we do want to keep it to, you know, where are the work, uh, where are the locations where uh, users are actually working out of. Okay, great. Um, another question, what is the best way to deploy Mac Office to be dialogue free where end users can run and print on the first open? So maybe Word and uh, um, PowerPoint or Excel open without a dialogue and allowing users to quickly print? Yeah, I can take this one. It's a great question. And, and in, in fact, you know, I think this was my big learning lesson when uh, I joined Slack back in 2015. 
um, in the I, I hadn't really understood how huge, how huge it was to uh, cut down the clutter of uh, you know, suppressing dialogues and really get in, you know, th this, this kind of stuff out of the way so that users can can really be productive from the get go. And 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 now it's very obvious to me, but um, it, it's something that that uh, I had to learn. And uh, I, I think uh, many other people, um, uh, you know, around software vendors learn as well. So I would say that the, the, the one biggest tip that I have is to set the office auto sign in um, uh, Boolean value to to true, and that's for the com.microsoft.office domain, and and that will get rid of all of the first run screens for you. If you're a volume license, it will allow you to go straight to the kind of the doc stage and start creating documents. If you're an Office 365 subscriber, it will get you directly to that dialog where you can enter your your uh, O365 username and password and get going. And especially with like the the uh, the single sign-on um, and uh, and one off stack that I was talking about previously, you know that's that's going to even be greater once all of that comes to fruition, where you'll just be able to launch an app for the very first time and just get going, which is exactly what what we want. There are some other like smaller things as well. Um, so uh, you'll you'll kind of notice uh, as you go through the apps, sometimes you'll see like uh, what we call a teaching call out where you'll see a, a little dialogue in PowerPoint saying, hey, did you know that you can turn on subtitles here? And uh, there there have been some kind of various uh, teaching call outs in, in Word, uh, sorry, in, in Outlook as well. Things like the uh, did you know you can send mail later and uh, hey, groups are available. And some of those dialogues you only see like on the third or the fourth boot of the app. Um, but uh, in fact, over the last couple of days, I was working with uh, Jeff's peers in the Outlook team uh, there, and uh, we've actually uh, started removing uh, a lot of those uh, kind of call outs and dialogues that have been uh, in the product for a long time so that, you know, we can give you a kind of a, a much cleaner interface and, and fundamentally just reduce the number of clicks that a user needs to take to be productive. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see. So we've got an, we've got a very interesting question here. Uh, installing Microsoft Office updates with Monkey, which gets installed by root user, breaks Office when the root user has more secure UMask of 077. Did you expect that? Well, unlike kind of all of the questions that are going to Jonathan, you know, th this is a question that I haven't received before. So <laughs> I'm going to take this one offline. Yeah, this um, I would not expect that. That sounds like a that like, sounds like a good follow up on that one. Um, all right. So Microsoft Outlook seems to be missing reply to header. Is this something you might consider adding? I often send emails and don't want replies personally. Yep, good question. Uh, I know there's a difference, you know, when us switching over to our new sync stack, um, I know we don't have like the ability to view the headers and that's one of the top requests we have from uh, user voice and our feature suggestions. So I think I think these are related, although I'll have to confirm. Uh, so we have a request with our new, you know, sync team that we're working with about uh, the ability to, you know, view the headers or view source and um, if that is related, that's probably why we don't have it in the new Outlook. Uh, if there was a recent change and you're not using the new Outlook and something disappeared, let me know. Could be, you know, a regression and we'll figure that one out. Okay, great. Um, Max, maybe this one is for you. It's a Teams question. Uh, since Mac OS, Mac OS Teams notifications will be an option at some point, We'll be able to use a mobile config profile to set that option. Uh, sorry, my well, Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. OK, uh, it's a question for me, right? I'm assuming not for Max. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Eric. OK, uh, no. Uh, I, I don't think that's that's in the plans for uh, the configuration. I'll make sure 
that that's uh, that's taken back to the team. Fantastic. I'm sorry. Harry is a uh, defender. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Max is defender. Harry's teams. I'm still figuring this out. I'm working on it. It's all right. We'll get through no it. No worries. <laughs> um, is there any news on an Azure SSO extension for Mac OS? Uh, I can take this one. So, um, yeah, so similar to what we've been working on with OneAuth um, for integration of tokens between the Microsoft apps, there's a, a kind of a parallel effort going on so the 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 one off stack can also leverage the symbol sign on extensions that were introduced in uh, Catalina last year. And, and this is where you know one of the apps will be able to um, uh, ask the, the SSO broker uh, to acquire the tokens, but the, uh, the the tokens will actually stay with the broker and will not be passed back through the apps. Um, so yes, the, there is definitely work going on here, both at the, the Mac OS and the iOS level, and there will be uh, more information in the coming months on uh, on rollout of that. Okay, fair enough. Um, we've got another OneDrive question here. Uh, so Jonathan, <laughs> um, it's a challenge to monitor OneDrive client sync issues, which puts our data at risk. Uh, when will we have reports on OneDrive client sync issues? Is that possible? The OneDrive usage report does not have enough information. Uh, okay, so not a KFM question. Um, uh, I think late last year at Ignite, we actually talked about this, but we are bringing uh, more in-depth um, client sync client reporting, uh, and it's going to be probably coming to a public beta um, in the coming months. Uh, so you can probably sign up for that. Um, but we are looking to bring a lot of information so that you can know, hey, you know, how many devices are set up with OneDrive? How many devices are in sync? Uh, if they are not in sync, what kind of errors and issues they're running into, uh, version numbers and all that, and also deployment information for a known folder move. Uh, so common problem that we hear from admins, uh, we're working hard on that and uh, look, you know, look forward to an announcement in the next month or so. Okay, um, if I can keep you here and follow up with you on another OneDrive question, um, when will OneDrive support all valid macOS characters in a file name? For instance, for instance, the pipe, a single and double quotes, um, and can be annoying and painful sometimes. Yeah, um, totally hear you on that one. Unfortunately, the limitations aren't something that we just set on the client side by itself. Uh, the service itself does not accept uh, those character limitations, even though the Mac client uh, can work with them probably fine. Um, so, so it's a much bigger effort for us to say, hey, let's just go and support these. So while we don't currently have any plans to support all characters available on Mac OS uh, within the service, uh, we are working to make uh, ingesting files with these characters uh, less painful on the Mac. Uh, so we're looking to build automated scripts uh, whenever we do run into these issues. That, that resolution is you press one button and it will help you rename and fix up all these characters for all the files inside the OneDrive namespace. Um, so we're currently working on that, but uh, evidently not available yet. OK, very good. Um, are there any chance of DBL or DBS licensing similar to on the Windows likely to happen? I can take this one. It's uh, so this is around uh, device based licensing, uh, shared licensing, uh, also sometimes called shared computer activation, but it's, it's where you don't have a kind of a one to one relationship between the computer and the user. We have like multiple users using the same um, physical machine. Um, it's kind of prevalent in especially like EDU scenarios. Um, and kind of healthcare scenarios as well, labs. Um, this is one of those questions that uh, I think, you know, once we solve this problem, I'll be able to retire. Um, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm kind of not close to retiring yet. So it's uh, it's still going to take a, a while. Um, I would, uh, I would, uh, recommend that if you do have like shared computers uh, that you need to get up and running that you continue to use volume licensing for now um, as uh, we, we've got shared computers activation on the backlog but um, nothing anytime soon I'm afraid. 
All right, very good. Um, let's see. Windows Outlook has a cleanup conversation command. Will that come to the Mac Outlook? I don't know if that's a question All for right. you. The first of many parody questions, which maybe I'll, I'll answer cleanup, but then I'll, I'll speak generically. Um, right now, no plans for cleanup conversation. I know it's actually a, a personal favorite of many folks on our team. Um, I would put this into the bucket of there are features that you know users enjoy and love on Windows Outlook, and we want to understand what are the top ones that we could potentially bring into Outlook for Mac. Um, you know, it's not we're not out to try to copy every feature, and what are really what we're trying to do is bring the you know the features that users expect on all of their endpoints, whether it's mobile, Windows, uh, and to make sure there's a consistent experience on, on Mac. So um, what we've been doing in the new Outlook is, one, we needed to kind of bridge some of the big gaps from the legacy app. When we released Insider Fast, you know, it was more of a proof of concept. We had the sync engine, you know, stood up with online search, you know, with the sync window, and we wanted to get that uh, feedback that, hey, this is actually working in terms of you're no longer downloading my whole profile to the Mac. Um, you know, uh, search is working great. Uh, I used to have spotlight issues, you know, as an example. And so what we've had to do is build in, you know, features that weren't quite ready last fall, like we brought add-ins in, unified inbox, uh, contacts, which is a whole module that we just shipped. Um, but then also, shipping features that are new to the platform. So we brought like snooze, which is something you might do on your phone or web, uh, ignore conversation. So I think that's an example of where if we have snooze and ignore, that kind of shows that, you know, something like cleanup could come if we hear enough feedback on it. Uh, another example is mail tips. So we now have mail tips finally in the new Outlook. Um, but you know we don't have all of the the mail tips from windows outlook but the top requests that we had heard from users like external recipients or out of office message being you know uh, up so lots of good feedback there and so you know we'll continue on this march of bringing in top feature requests and that goes back to the feedback we've heard in in slack just from admins what what they need for themselves and what they need for their end users All right, fair enough. Fantastic. Um, let's see. But, well, there's actually, if I can follow up with uh, the office, there's a couple questions here that we have on being un unable to open a shared office personal calendar. Um, can you speak specifically about that and how um, how that maybe isn't working on the Mac side or maybe the approach? Yeah, yeah I can. Um, so I think. There, there's a few things looking at our legacy stack, which is EWS, and we basically went through this huge uh, push to move over to REST for calendar, to improve calendar sharing. So you can open shared calendars, view free busy. And so REST calendar is something available for Office 365 mailboxes. Um, and that covered, you know, we call this like a new model. Uh, it's also called remote calendar sharing. And there's still a lot of users who had calendars open through EWS in our old model sharing. And so what we're doing in the new Outlook is we're bringing both those over to the new stack. Um, so calendar sharing isn't supported yet. It's something that we're, we're working on. It's a huge, to, to me, it's actually one of our biggest hurdles in getting us to the next ring to slow. You know, full delegation, shared mailboxes, shared calendars. Um, so that's coming on the new side. And on the new side, then we'll be able to address some of the gaps mentioned that you may be experiencing using EWS uh, sync. So that's kind of the generic answer. I think some of the functionality, uh, maybe seeing it in the my day, the to do bar, you know, colleagues free busy there. I think that's something, you know, I would dig into and, and look a little bit more if we could provide that. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we've got a couple of development questions here that um, I want to pull in. Uh, will there be a process to beta test ARM based applications um, or a uh, an office deployment toolkit available? And those may not be the exact same things. I may be confused. They're different, but I can grab those. 
Um, Thank so you. as far as beta testing, the Office app's running on Apple's ARM Silicon for uh, folks who may have acquired their own Apple Dev Kit. Um, probably not. Uh, at the moment, we don't have anything ready for you to beta test. Um, uh, what you saw in the demo was uh, apps that ran on on ARM, but uh, we had done some um, extreme measures to remove components that were not ready for ARM uh, to get them up, to get the apps up and running. Uh, so the apps are not ready to ship yet. Um, the apps we expect will ship as universal apps, so they'll support both ARM and Intel at the same time. And um, I don't know exactly the time frame by which we'll have that done and be ready. Uh, my my guess would be that if you want to beta test that would be to enroll in Insider Fast, uh, and at the time that the apps start building uh, Universal and we start shipping those the universe through the Insider tree, uh, you could beta test that way. Um, we don't expect there to be significant platform differences. Uh, the intention is to support Visual Basic and and all the other stuff that the Office apps have. Um, so I don't think there'll be much. Uh, difference from that would require beta testing, but certainly you're welcome to try insider releases. As far as an Office developer toolkit, um, again, no plans for that. Uh, we're trying to move to a more secure model where we are dis actively discouraging uh, external third-party plugins that run inside of Office's process space. As as Jeffrey mentioned, so the issues we've had with add-ins and Outlook are um, that the add-ins go and make assumptions about how the apps are built and what they can do. And uh, either that makes it harder for us to make changes or we make changes and then the apps crash when the add-ins are, are misbehaved or the apps running in our space are just fundamentally less secure. Uh, either our apps are less secure because we don't know what these third party add-ins are doing. Um, the world is a very different place now than it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago when the Office Dev Kit was first written and we really frankly don't want uh, people extending uh, uh, the apps within our process space. Um, the, the office add-ins, uh, uh, siloed uh, add-in model, uh, um, extension model is much more secure and is the direction we're really trying to move people toward. So no, we don't have plans to to release a, a, an added development kit effectively. Okay, very, very good, thank you. Uh, just a comment here from Neil on behalf of the Macamins community, I just want to say a big Thank you to all of you for your tireless engagement. We really appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Neil. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, and Paul, I have a question for you here. Uh, are there any changes coming to the MS update script? Uh, we have ongoing issues with apps not prompting the user to update, with apps not attempting to update again if the user defers, and the script hanging for some indeterminate reason. Um, yeah, so the in, in fact the the kind of the 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 issues that are being described there are, are within core Microsoft Auto Update itself rather than the script. The script is just like a wrapper around uh, Auto Update. Um, so we've. Uh, we added some features over the past few months um, that uh, weren't working in all scenarios. So we had a big push um, in the last six weeks to get things like um, the deadline um, portion of auto update uh, working properly in, in all of the expected scenarios. There's a couple of scenarios that we're still tracking um, that uh, the aren't working still things like um, the deadline dialog will come up before uh, updates are ready to install so you kind of like you hit the button to quit and install apps and only then does it go in and start downloading the updates so so th things th some of the process is, is a little bit back to front so uh, so those are things that we're tackling uh, now and uh, over the next kind of month or so that there is a, a list of kind of issues and, and fixes that I have up on the macadmins.software website. If you go to macadmins.software slash MAU, then uh, you'll see a kind of a list of all of the, the, the MAU bugs that we're tracking and, and what the status is of, of all of those. And then once we get those kind of core MAU issues resolved, then uh, there, there won't need to be any changes uh, to the uh, MS update script. Okay, great. Uh, Jonathan, can you comment on the hack 
where some groups use sim links and hard links to redirect folders themselves in regard to OneDrive K F R. Please. Sure. Um, so I don't think there's ever going to be a world where I'm just going to be like, yes, go ahead and do that, uh, because that kind of implies we've played around with it, we've tested it, and you know we gave it the seal of approval and everything works. Uh, in theory, it should work. You know, it's just a redirection. The sync line should just go through it. Uh, but it's hard for us to say, you know, yes, go ahead and do it without, you know, us doing any validation on, on that sort of thing. Yep, fair enough. Very good. All right. Um, is there anything on, uh, in the works to make sure that Outlook syncs accurately on the Mac app? as it does on the PC. For example, in some organization, they've noticed um, mail and calendar sync not correctly working on the Macs where it is working on the Windows side um, and adding another person's calendar they don't know if they see is accurate or not. Um, and they've had to use the web app instead. Yeah, good question. Uh, so the answer is the new stack we're using in the new Outlook. Um, it's a shared sync stack that's used by Outlook on iOS and Android and also the Win 10 mail and calendar apps. So uh, it's, you know, and what we've seen in the past year plus uh, from developing it is just way more reliable. It uses a sync window, as I mentioned, so we're not downloading everything to your Mac and using up a ton of space. Um, and really in terms of, yeah, search, uh, online search, uh, comes with that. Uh, if you're seeing issues in the new Outlook where, yes, yeah, something's on the web or something's on uh, Windows Outlook, but it's not yet on uh, your Mac, then we definitely want to know about it. Um, we ran into so many issues with EWS. We've used it for 10 years. Um, it's time has come, you know, and that's really what what's helped us move to this new stack. We, we've been trying to fix issues left and right with Calendar Sync and mail sync and reminders popping up, which is something I, I've seen uh, mentioned in the Q&A. You know, I think in using this app, we've been using it internally for a while now and the feedback we've received in Insider Fast, uh, it really is a huge improvement. Um, and, uh, but we're not yet in production. We want feedback and we wanna hear uh, from users who are having problems. Uh, so that's, that's the answer for it. Fantastic. Um, I, I want to go a little more high level um, because we do have a lot of questions that are very specific on uh, feature parity between apps, but at a higher level, um, is, is there anything being done to ensure that the new features that are brought to one platform are considered for both platforms? Uh, I can start with that one particular. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think it applies to everything. And also, it's a good question overall because we talked about teams and their approach. Uh, it's something we're always thinking about. Uh, you know, I'd say uh, we've evolved on the Outlook team from a you know very platform specific. We need to stabilize. We need to make sure we're not crashing all the time. That was our focus. To a more with this new stack, an ability to deliver features. And I, so I mentioned earlier, it's not about copying everything from Windows Outlook. Uh, it is about you know, adding the top requested features, um, you know, in your organization, there might be something and you're like, we need retention policies. You know, I've heard that for years, like, and this is something now we've finally been able to have these conversations because that wasn't supported by EWS. So um, it is, you know, it's, it's on the forefront uh, of our minds as we plan the product, we're going to roll out. It's a feature by feature discussion, uh, really. And so it's not, you're not going to see a bunch of features dumped one day, but if you've been using Insider Fast, you'll know we've been adding features consistently since November, since we debuted uh, in Insider Fast. And so we'll continue to keep doing it. And it'll be stuff that you're familiar with from Windows Outlook, but new stuff that you're seeing popping up, you know, maybe on Outlook on the web, things like when you do a search, you know, uh, getting better suggestions, getting, you know, maybe you miss misspelled something in your search, getting that correction uh, on the editor side, more advanced editor functionality uh, to help you with, you know, composing and grammar and things like that accessibility. So 
It's it's more about making sure the new features that you see in phone and web are coming to Mac faster and not just us like conditional formatting. That's on Win32 Outlook. Let's get that over to Mac Outlook. So uh, it's uh, it really is based on all of your feedback. So we're listening. Excellent, fantastic. Let, let oh. me take part of that then as well, uh, kind of more broadly. Uh, a broad question. It's a kind of a broad answer. Um, so when we when we talk about feature parity across platforms, there's there's kind of two things going on. You have what does a given platform require you to do, and what does a given platform allow you or offer you to do in terms of functionality. And one can be a constraining issue. They can both be constraining or or granting. Uh, uh, aspects. For example, the Mac sandbox is a constraining aspect. We have to honor the Mac sandbox to have our apps in the Mac App Store. And that puts requirements and restrictions on what the apps can do. Uh, it, it greatly reduces some of the cross process communication functionality. Um, that's why third party plugins and add ins that drive Olay can be challenging, uh, or it requires you to change how your macros work to, to ask for permission to write to a file. Uh, these are things that that Apple, in, in their infinite wisdom, has said this is the policy on this platform and what we're going to require apps on this platform to do. And so you end up with constraints and requirements that are different on the Mac than you do on Windows because of what the, the underlying operating system requires you to do. The other side of that is what are features that the platform lets you do because it has some technology that may not exist anywhere else. Uh, if we go back and look at access, I don't know what their current implementation is, but many, many years ago, Access used uh, their underlying database engine was this thing called Jet that was fundamentally tied to uh, running on Intel processors using some some uh, Apple a system, some Windows APIs. And when the Macs were PowerPC based, we couldn't, literally couldn't port the code because it required features that were only available on the chipset and the operating system. So, so that's why this whole notion of, say, Electron apps stepping up to a higher level, looking at what can you do anywhere, port your right ones run anywhere, is in some ways very compelling and very interesting. And then you can deliver your features anywhere. Um, at the same time, it's also perhaps not native to that platform. Uh, and so you end up with feature gaps because you know the, the 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 ui isn't the same or doesn't have any notifications or, or whatever it happens to be um so so if we take a step back and we look at the, there are these these requirements restrictions and benefits that that different platforms bring into the mix when you're trying to target an application that runs across the board at a high level we really want the features to be anywhere and so the degree to which a feature can be anywhere and can be written designed planned, implemented from the beginning to be available on all platforms, absolutely, we're going to make it available everywhere because that's the right thing to do for our customers who want that universal office experience. The degree to which an existing feature, perhaps a legacy feature, was targeted, written, designed on a particular platform for a particular platform's capabilities, that's a harder thing to talk about bringing forward. And so then when Outlook's looking at, hey, let's bring up a whole new stack, it takes time, and it gets us to a place where Outlook can then be much more feature parity across all, all of its platforms because it's designed to be that way. And that's that's a fundamental paradigm shift that Microsoft has been going through for many years. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do, but it takes a really long time, particularly when you have really big apps that have been around. I mean, Mac Outlook, even when it was called Entourage, has only been around for, what, 15 years, 18 years? Excel's been around. Excel was the first app ever written for the Mac back in 1983 before the Mac shipped publicly. It's old and it takes a while to move that code around. So I guess the short answer is we are wrestling with platform restrictions, platform capabilities, legacy code, and the desire to meet our customers where they are. And it's challenging to put all those rocks into one basket. We're working on it. Um, but it may not all get there. It kind of depends on which leverage you pull. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you for that follow-up. It was very good. Um, let's see. We've only got time for a couple more questions here. Um, and so maybe to add to the question of the volume licensing apps for Mac OS, 
uh, App Store, it would be really great to allow this for use in computer labs because Catalina stores App Store apps on the read-only system, but labs have high traffic. And without volume license, students would hit activation limits very quickly. Um, so as far as deploying Office in a lab and, and Mac App Store versus other methods, um, are, there, are there any comments there? Yeah, so uh, so I can take that one. It's it's kind of similar to some of the other comments I had. I definitely see where um, where the where the poster is going because I, uh, I mentioned that in shared computer scenarios, it's always best to use volume license. But of course, Mac App Store only supports subscription. Um, so, so those two things seemingly uh, are in conflict. The, the the one kind of problem you get back to is that in, in a in a kind of a shared computer environment, you would need to be deploying the Mac App Store apps via VPP, which is a method that currently doesn't work well. Um, so we would still get back into that conversation that really your your kind of your best practice. Um, for for that type of scenario is to acquire the uh, the office apps from the content delivery network and, and use mal for updating them. That that would be the most reliable way. Okay, fantastic. Um, I think uh, this this is probably going to be the last question, and it, I'm going to I'm going to make it a little more generic. Uh, how would someone join the um, technical preview or fast track programs for any of these applications? Sure, I can take that one as well. Um, so if uh, if we're talking about the core Office apps of uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and uh, OneNote, um, to to get kind of the the beta um, the the beta releases, you'll definitely want to acquire them from the content delivery network, not the Mac App Store. Um, the second is that if you go into a Microsoft Auto Update, um, there is a kind of a drop down there where you can uh, choose between um, the production channel versus the inside a slow channel versus inside a fast. Um, production, you're only going to see one one build a month go out. Uh, inside a slow, you're going to usually see two builds a month, and, and those are supported builds, um, but they give you like an early supported peek into the, the kind of upcoming features and, and fixes and other performance enhancements. And uh, if you if you want to live on uh, live on the edge and uh, get all of the especially the really cool stuff that, that Jeff and the rest of the Outlook team is putting out right now, then you want to change that channel to Insider Fast. So so those those are just uh, channel settings with inside um, Microsoft Auto Update. Um, I'll probably hand it to Jonathan because OneDrive is a, is a little separate for, for channel support. Uh, sorry, we're talking about getting into the insider's ring basically, right? Correct. Uh, yeah, we're talking about uh, channel uh, channel changes. Yeah, so within the OneDrive Sync client, um, you can do the same thing to opt into our insider's uh, ring to get the latest uh, kind of pre-release features. Uh, there's a little checkbox in the about tab inside of your uh, preference menu uh, that you can just check to get into the insiders. Uh, you can also kind of deploy a plist there to uh, enable the same thing. Okay, fantastic. Well, everyone, um, we've run out of time for today, um, and I, I just want to say thank you very much for all the questions and for our presenters today taking the time out. Um, we've got a lot of additional comments here on how awesome this event has been. How uh, it's great to see so many of the Microsoft people um, in the team in the Mac and Min Slack and reaching out and being available to do this. So again, thank you to everyone. Uh, really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come join us. Hey, and Russell, thank you so much and the rest of the PSU team for inviting us to come along. I, I think this is uh, the Campfire series has just been incredible this year. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate it. Thanks again.